Yo, long hairs. Welcome to episode 98 of Let It Ride. Here we talk long hair in business, advocate for hair equality, and celebrate men's long manes with hair whips and high fives. If you're a guy with long hair, you're in the right place. This is El Rubio. I'm here with El Moreno. Yeah, what up? At the Long Hairs Global Headquarters. And joining us today from Rochester, Minnesota, is a longtime member of the Long Hairs community. He's a long hair with a unique physical characteristic that many of us surely take for granted and who has a valuable and insightful perspective on long hair and what it means. He is one of several men in the community who is visually impaired, in his, in his case, legally blind. And if you, think trying your, if you think tying your hair up without seeing yourself in the mirror is easy, he's going to tell you what it's really like. We are pumped to have you on the show. Chris Matthews, El Ciego, welcome to Let It Ride. What What's going up? on? Dude. Awesome. It's so good to be here. I'm so pumped to uh, to be on the podcast. So thanks for having me on, guys. Likewise, man. Long time coming. Oh, for sure. Long time. No see. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, man, just uh, start us off. Introduce yourself. Where are you now? I already mentioned you're in Minnesota. What are you up to? Maybe just a quick recap on how we got connected. Sure. So I am um, 23. And uh, just moved to Minnesota last August, so I've been here uh, not quite a year yet. Uh, kind of getting my roots established here, and uh, find you know I've got my own apartment, got a job, and uh, starting to put things together. And um, as far as uh, being involved in the community, I have been around for a good two, three years at this point. Um, actually, almost longer than that. Now that I'm thinking about it, probably three, four. Um, kind of end of my freshman year of college, I think, is when I found you guys. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, um, have been, uh, active watching the YouTube channel and, and found the Facebook group a few years ago. And, uh, I've been very fortunate to be a part of the community for a long time and a uh, long time user of the uh, shampoo and conditioner. So, uh, you know, that's, that's why this is looking the way it's looking is, uh, it's all you guys. So does it live up to the epic and ideal titles? Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, from from the remarks I get around, uh, it it does, and uh, I can say that the, the hair feels great, even if I can't see what it looks like all the time. Um, so you guys, you you hit the mark there, hundred percent. Awesome, dude. Best news we could hear so far. Uh, so tell us just a little bit about your long hair journey. How long have you been growing it out? Uh, a little history behind your your hair growth. Uh, bring us up to speed on the hair. Sure. So. Um, kind of has an interesting story tied into it. So my uh, spring semester of my freshman year was awful. And um, I think it was around that time that a buddy of mine told me he was going to leave and uh, go to another college. That was, that was rough. And so throughout sophomore year, like after this semester kind of kicked everything off, it was just like, not, not great times. Um, and um, I went through a lot personally throughout uh, sophomore year. And I hit this point where um, a relationship ended and I was just not in the best of, of mental places. And um, I was watching videos of people skydiving on YouTube. And I was like, you know what? I need to do something crazy that breaks me out of this, this funk. You know, I got I to get back to doing, doing life and doing life spectacularly. And um, so I decided that with uh, my buddy, uh, Derek, that I was going to go skydiving. And he's like, you know what? If you do it, I'll do it. And right before going skydiving was my last haircut. Um, I joked that I wanted to be aerodynamic for skydiving. <laughs> um, and so I did, I, I was, uh, growing up, I was kind of ones all around. Um, it was very easy. So, you know, that's kind of how I, I rocked ones, twos and the occasional three on the buzzer, but, um, that was it. And, and I went skydiving and uh, it was amazing. Um, but after that, I, I didn't intentionally start growing out the hair. Um, I just kind of, I worked for a summer and kind of kept putting off going to get it cut and kept putting it off and kept putting it off. And all of a sudden it had been long enough that I, I started having curls in my hair, which was not something I had ever had before. Um, and I had uh, was hitting the years and kind of hit the awkward stage. And I had a bit of an Afro going on for quite a while um, and um, went through some really rough haircuts. And that's something I, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about as, as far as my perspective on um navigating the, the hair world legally blind because I had some really rough haircuts where they took off a lot more length. Um, I would be well past the shoulders uh, if I knew now what I knew then. 
Um, but uh, it's been about three years and uh, I'm planning on um, actually the spot where I am right now, just about shoulder length is where I want to be. So most of everything past this point uh, come the great cut 2024 is uh, going to children with hair loss. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm really close to being super happy with where I am. I think it's, it's taken a lot to, to get to this point, but finding the community, um, finding you guys and, and realizing that there are other people finding good products. You put all of that together with kind of getting my life on a better track. And I think it really um, all ties in with, with my hair journey. So that's, that's the, uh, believe it or not, that's the short version. Badass, man. Well summarized. And congratulations on hitting the shoulder. It's a cause for celebration when every man reaches the uh, shoulder length. And especially if you got the curls, it takes a little bit longer. Right. Yeah. Uh, El Sergioso had his video where he talked about that, that it's it's more of a battle. Um, and that is that is very much true. So to, to all you guys with curls, uh, hang in there. Hang in there. It, it gets better. What's been some of the toughest things with the curls for you? I think just the unpredictability. I mean, there are days where this mess is you know, out another two inches and, and, uh, just doing whatever it wants. Yeah. Um, a lot of volume, and, if you will. Yes. Yeah. The hair gets <laughs> loud, uh, a lot of volume, but, um, I think that that's part of the unpredictability. Um, and also from the legally blind standpoint, um, getting a handle on the way things look, it's not necessarily that I am self-conscious exactly, but not being aware of, um, the way that certain looks are, are interpreted by the world around you and, and trying to kind of get a sense for um, what different things mean and how to present yourself um, mm -hmm. is something that has to be learned where I think inherently in a lot of people with vision, you know, obviously you learn by looking around and seeing what people think and, and you know, the reactions you get walking around. I don't get that. So um, yeah. having to learn the, that trade has been um, quite an interesting part of, of my journey. Dude, that is fascinating. Now, something I just want to clarify for all the listeners out there, because you've said uh, several times, you know, legally blind. Does that mean you cannot see anything at all? Or where? what is it like? And is there any way you could uh, kind of walk us through so we could visualize maybe what being in your shoes is like? Absolutely. So I was born at 26 weeks. I have a, uh, a condition called retinopathy of prematurity, which is quite a mouthful. So I shortened it to ROP. Um, and essentially what happened is this. So I was born very prematurely, 26 weeks is a, a touch bit early. Um, and, um, I was put in an incubator, um, to finish developing, uh, mm -hmm. in, in hospital. And in that incubator, there was too much oxygen. Um, you know, in, in the, the late nineties, when I was born, um, they still were kind of figuring out how to dial in the right amount of oxygen to allow development, but not too much. Uh, unfortunately, I got a little bit too much. And what happened is the blood vessels that were behind my eyes um, burst. And the way that I explain this to people is if you think of your vision as a movie screen, your retina is the movie screen, your eye is the projector. So most projectors are made of, you know, that canvas, you know, it's a very sturdy material that um, isn't going anywhere. Um, my movie screen is made of tissue paper. And when my blood vessels behind my eyes burst, the tissue paper um, was... Uh, put upon by a bucket of water. And so it caused a lot of tearing. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially what I'm left with is I have no ability to look through both eyes at the same time. So I cannot look through both my left and right eye and see one image. Um, I actually, I don't even see two images. I can only focus on one or the other. So in my left eye, I have a very central spot of vision that I can use for looking around a room. Um, that's what I'm using right now to kind of try to make sure I'm, I'm looking towards the camera, that sort of thing. Okay. And then with my right eye, I have a very small corner way down um, that I, I jokingly call my signature eye because that's about <laughs> all it's good for. Um, <laughs> but um, I've learned to use, you know, I've learned to navigate the world using a white cane. Um, I read Braille. I learned a lot of things that a lot of people who have no vision um, would learn because eventually it's very likely that I'll lose the vision that I have. But um, it's, that's kind of how my vision works. And it's been very steady. I've been very lucky to have very stable vision. Mm. Um, but one other thing I do want to add is that being visually impaired or being legally blind exists on a spectrum. So you can have everything from people who are, uh, let's say you can drive a car with your contacts in, but when you take your contacts out, you might be legally blind. 
um, all the way to seeing nothing and every space that you can think of in between those two. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of exist, you know, between those, those points. Okay. So go back to your haircut when you mentioned unique challenges and going through that, knowing now what you knew then things might've been a little bit different, uh, having a better sense of your, what you are actually seeing. What were you talking about a couple of minutes ago? Sure. So I, I did a lot of research, both, you know, with watching videos that you guys had put out, you know, putting out into the community, because the thing that I kept have happening uh, the, let me try that again. <laughs> the thing that I kept have happening to me was, was that I would go in and I, I tried to kind of put everything on pause with the, the hairdresser I was talking to and say, hey, look, you know, here's the deal. I said, I, I can't see what you're doing here, but here's what I want to do. You know, I would even take the hair and um, using my, my sense of touch, I'd say, OK, about here. It, you know, is where I would like to, to cut because this is where the, I can feel that the ends are starting to get a little crispy. Um, and this is what I want to take off. I don't want to lose much more length than this, if you can avoid it. Um, and I felt like from the videos and things that I had done a really good job of being really clear. But every time I would go in, I would walk out and there was so much more gone than I wanted. Mm. And it was really frustrating mm. because I didn't know what else I had to say or how else I could communicate that. Um, and uh, right before my, my little sister got married um, a couple summers ago, I had one that just, I was not quite to this point, but kind of close. Um, and they must have taken off two, three inches of hair. Oh. And I, I just walked out and I was like, I, I was so disheartened um, because, you know, here I am going to this wedding where I'm going to be, you know, I was in the wedding and then I had to have pictures and it was not, uh, not my, my finest moment. Um, but it was just, it was frustrating because it was like, what do I have to understand visually to make this work? What am I missing? You know, is there something that if I were sighted, would this make more sense? And would I have the ability to ask for the things that I need better? Um, and, uh, for the last couple of times I've gotten my haircut, it has not been a hairdresser. Uh, it's been the girlfriend and she's done a better job. So, um, I, I just appreciate that that is the way for me to go personally, because it hasn't been frustrating. So that's, awesome. that's finding a person to do it that knows you and knows what you are looking for is a, a piece of advice. I guess I would have, if you're worried about that from a visual standpoint. Yeah. Really interesting, man. Uh, and there's really, you're kind of at the mercy of how they're interpreting the, the words that you're telling them when you're, when you're at the salon or at the barber shop. And uh, so that actually brings up something else that we were talking about last week. And I'm kind of paraphrasing how you explained it to me, but just understanding the visual nuance as someone who can't see the way that most people see uh, having providing the tools to understand what things look like. Uh, you gave us a good example of on our website using the alt descriptions to have or, or the captions to describe the photos a little bit further or uh, other situations like that but can you just describe a little bit more what you mean and maybe if, if you have any examples of that yeah absolutely so this is this is something that i didn't know it's one of those things i didn't know that i didn't know um when i started this out because it's really hard to talk about this and not sound like you know i'm not confident in myself and that's not where i come from but essentially the way that I explain this is, let's say that you had a friend from um, another country, right? That was going to come to, uh, let, let's, let's use California because you guys have, you know, the surfer culture that exists. And there is, there is surfer hair. Um, in Minnesota, we have hockey hair. Um, yes. There are these nuances to hair that fit with lifestyles and with a way of, of life and a way of thinking. And people are very expressive of that. Um, and, you know, I could maybe tell you whether someone has short or long hair, um, visually, I mean, but beyond that, I mean, how you wear your hair, what does that signify? What does that mean? Those are things that I'm learning to understand and incorporate into how I think about things. So, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in, in braids and, you know, the, the, um, you know, the Viking kind of style of, of you know, doing the different kinds of braids. And uh, I want to find a metal um, hair 
ring. Uh, there's like the, it's, it's almost like a napkin holder that you put in your hair, but it's like, it's like a metal um, ponytail. A lot of them have like Nordic patterns on them. I think that's interesting. Mm-hmm. But a lot of that for me comes from the, the idea of the thing more than the look that it's going to give me. I mean, it's probably going to look cool, I think. Um, but the, the, it comes from understanding that that, you know, that look carries with it that, you know, Nordic style and, and that sort of thing, which I find fascinating and interesting from a historical perspective. But a lot of my research into like hairstyles and, and hair nuance is from the perspective of the idea of it. Where did it come from? Who created it? Who popularized it? What does it mean? Rather than that looks badass. Because yeah, I'm sure it does, but it's hard for me to catch that, you know, that um, angle. What does looking badass mean? What, what does right. that mean? Yeah looks badass right and i think it's it's something that um whether you're whether you're blind or not i think it's something that we all can can take something from because for me um i walk around with it with a five and a half foot tall white cane everywhere i go and so people stare at me because that's something they've never seen before so to me if i grow up my hair and throw it up in a braid and whatever people are going to stare at me whether i had a military you know short haircut or whether I have the long hair. And so if I feel empowered because I know that this is something I want to do and it, it's something that I feel like I'm going to, you know, have a good time with, I'm going to do it because people are going to stare at me no matter what that takes the form of. And so for me, that translates to like, well, yeah, then hell yeah, I'm going to do it. And I think for everybody else, you know, there's, there's a lesson there in that, you know, people are going to judge you visually, whether you like it or not. People are going to take whatever message that they want to take from your hair or, you know, the, the, the way that you wear your hair, or the things that you wear with your hair. But if you're doing the things that you want to do and the idea of how that's all put together and how that presents itself is something that you're proud of, then, I mean, what better podcast are we on than to say, let it ride? That's that's the point. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well said, dude. Uh, have you felt empowered by your hair as you've been growing it out and kind of getting a little bit more length? even maybe before the braid styles are trying some of this other stuff more recently. Absolutely. Um, I think I'm finally, um, I, I have been called ma'am a few times, which the first time it happened, I was like, ha ha, I've made it yeah. because <laughs> I am. Good sign. <laughs> yeah. And like, it, it was a weird thing because it was such a, an out there, you know, I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't, you know, feeling down on my hair that day or anything like that, but it happened. And I was like, you know what? That means I've finally gotten to the point where my hair is officially long in the eyes of someone who can see what's going on. And I will take that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. And um, since getting into to baseball and, and pitching, um, which I'm happy to talk about in a minute, but since getting into that and realizing again, there is like baseball hairstyles and oh, there's yeah. some amazing dudes. You guys had Matt Strom on the podcast. Um, I'm a big Ben Gamble fan. Uh, you got Josh Hader. You know, there are all these guys, especially pitchers, which uh, I find fascinating. Fernando Tatis Jr. Yes, <laughs> dude, on the cover of the show, which I knew, yeah. but I did not know that he had one of your hair ties on the cover. That is the most badass yeah. thing. Crazy. Uh, blue. Dude, up. That's oh, amazing. Uh, speaking of Josh Hader, we have a package of hair ties inbound to his position. Actually, we have... <laughs> connections with Corbin. Yeah. And uh hopefully he's going to be able to you know hand a few things over to Josh Hader, but yes, our boy Blake Fox El Zorro. Uh as you know, I think yeah, you're familiar with him. He was in the Brewers organization, but at any rate, he still has some connections there and he's going to get those hair ties in the hands of a few of those long hairs. And hopefully we get them over to Gamel too. I mean, he's, he's the heavy hitter over there. Yeah. So. I, uh, it's been amazing. And I think um, I was so bummed about the, the Brewers uh, trading him to the Indians, but um, watching that, I think I'm watching that happen and realizing that I, I mean, I will not lie. A lot of the reason I follow Gamel and, and I love Ben Gamel was for the flow. Um, he's just such a cool guy. He's so laid back. Um, and he really embodies that, that long hair, um, uh, ball player kind of vibe. And I, I love it. Um, but he is so much fun to watch as a player. And I think it's made, it made me a better baseball fan. And then to see guys, you know, all of these players around the league that have long hair, um, it's, it's made me watch 
baseball a little differently in, in some ways, because it's like, wow, there is style here. There is something to be said for, again, that idea of the way that people present themselves and the fact that long hair in professional baseball is becoming something that is uh, not only very real for one or two guys anymore, but, you know, you can almost find a guy on every team somewhere that's got it. So oh, yeah, I like it. I like that it's catching on and I'm excited to, uh, to see where it goes. Totally, man. It's trendy. It's trendy right now. Yes. In MLB. Hair hey, if your hair I mean, ties all, can jump on that, we can get our man. Yeah, the, the all hater all sports. I mean, really, uh, I'd say NBA is the only thing. It's really kind of lacking it, but there's a few guys there, but not nothing like hockey or football or baseball. This is you could throw on any game and you're going to see the flow every yeah, year. Living in Minnesota guys, now. I didn't, yeah. Every season, right. more yeah. guys. Totally. Yeah, living in Minnesota now, I was not aware how much hockey hair was a, a big thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there are these YouTube videos that this guy used to make called the All Hair Hockey Team. Oh, yeah. Yes, and dude. Hilarious. Hilarious. Yes. We've tried to replicate that with MLB. Uh, you know, we, th- we think our guys have done a good job. You guys have crushed that. <laughs> Yeah, it hasn't gone quite as viral as the hockey hair, unfortunately. But but it needs to. If you have not seen those videos about yeah. the uh, the all hair MLB teams, go check them out. Uh, They're amazing, dude. Sticking on the MLB, man. So one of your big dreams is to is to learn to throw a pitch. Now I know you've done some extensive training, and you've got some really cool instructors who've been working with you and. Uh, who guys who've worked with some big time players and stuff. Am I right? What, what's this journey about? And uh, tell us where you're at and where this is going. Sure. So I, I've, it's something that's been on my radar for a while. Uh, last summer, I got the chance to go to batting cages with a couple of friends of mine and that went terribly. Uh, could not hit a ball. I think I batted 66 was my batting average for the session, which considering two of them, you know, my two hits were probably foul balls anyway. Um, you know, I, I'm, I fit right into the, the stereotype of, of a pitcher. Um, but the thing that amazed me is afterwards, some of my, my buddies were like, you know, if you think about pitching, if you think about what the guys talk about in terms of pitching, it's about consistency and it's about muscle memory. Neither of those things is called keeping your eye on the ball. And the fact that this, this side of baseball that I, you know, I love, I've been a baseball fan since I was about nine years old. Um, but the fact that this side of baseball exists where there might be something that there that isn't visual was so captivating to me. And I kind of had it in my head, like, I want to figure out how to pitch. Um, and so I reached out locally here in February and um, a post that I put in a group kind of blew up a little bit. And um, I got in touch with a guy named Mitch Brown. Um, he used to pitch in the, the Cleveland Indians organization, um, which is amazing how that circles around to, to our, our long hair, Ben Gamel. But um, yeah really cool guy. And and Mitch called me before our first uh, training session kind of said, Hey man, like I've been thinking about stuff, you know, I have some ideas for how we can make things work and and different things we can use as reference points. And he's into Mitch is into biomechanics and and it's all this stuff. And not for a second, was it this awkward over sensationalized, like, Oh, you're blind. Like, how is this going to work? Like Mitch was so ready to jump in. And when the media, you know, because I, I, I was in the local paper and a couple TV stations wanted in on it. And when those stories went out, it, it was almost disheartening to me because it was like, oh, you know, local blind man realizes dream of learning to pitch. And I was like, yes, that's part of it. Uh, you know, I, I would be lying if I said I wasn't blind and I would be lying if I said this isn't a dream I had. Yeah. But it's not some big story. I just want to learn to pitch. You know, I'm just happening to do this at 23 instead of five. Um, and so... Once the, the hype died down, I think it got easier for me to really get into it. Um, I've been out there um, probably half a dozen times at this point doing uh, some lessons. Um, and I actually just put out a, a, a video that I, I made um, talking a little bit about this process. But I, I think, like I've said with other things, as cliche as it may sound, the long hair tying into my confidence and that tying into me wanting to learn to pitch Um and finding what that is and and having the ability of the people and the resources to put that all together. My goal is to throw a strike 60 feet, six inches. I want to be able to throw from a mound to home plate. Um, You know, maybe, maybe down the road, a first pitch at a ball game would be great. 
Yeah. But I want to actually be able to make it. I don't want it to be, oh, look, the poor blind kid tried. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sure. I, I want it to be a first pitch. You want to I throw some gas? He fired a strike right down the <laughs> exactly. pipe. Yes, yes. <laughs> With a tail, a little tailing fastball, a little cut movement to it. Yeah, some something sauce. that something that yeah. moves in a direction that's not uh, down. <laughs> yeah, snap in the catcher's glove. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, have you heard that pop? with uh, some of the throws you've been doing in the glove? Uh, just the last time I went, I was able to play a little bit of catch. Um, got about two or three that I, you know, not regulation distance. I think we're about 30 feet right now, um, but I'm working on consistency and uh, velocity will come later when I can, you know, make that distance uh, farther. But right now it's, it's about um, finding that, that arm action, finding, you know, where I need to be with my body at different points in the delivery and the process of learning that is is so rewarding and, and so much fun. So I'm I'm having fun and I'm looking forward to getting back to it pretty soon here. That's awesome. Is uh is your left eye? Can you hone it? Can you see the catcher? No. Like when you're up there? Okay. Um, and and the interesting thing to me about pitching is um I, I was fortunate enough to go to a school for the blind uh in, in Wisconsin growing up. And one of the things that I learned from some of the staff there is that sometimes actually learning a skill without vision is better because yeah. you're not relying on, you know, my vision may be inconsistent or, um, you know, something may change for me, you know, a year or two from now, yeah. I, I don't know. And so if I learn to pitch without relying on my eyesight at all, it will mean that I can still pitch at that same level, even if I lose the vision. Yeah. Um, and so I'm trying as much as I can to, pitch without relying on the eyesight because I want to be able to continue to do this it's 19 hours. Oops. Sorry. My computer likes to yell, uh, um, all good. but uh, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's where that's at. If that awesome. How about some other athletics like running for example, uh, or not necessarily sports, but just exercise being out there. Uh, have you been able to learn or like weightlifting, for example, have you gotten into any other stuff? Um, so I, I did, you know, a few sports in high school. I did swim. Uh, I did track and field. Um, the ironic part of this is so, um, with the blind, th there's a lot of adaptations made to some sports. And so for track and field, there's a sport called the tandem run. And essentially it's where you're running with one person who has slightly more vision than the other. And you're, you're tethered together by, a you know, a two or three foot tether and you, yeah. you run together. Um, and it's kind of a guided run. And the scary part is for a while, I was the more sighted of the people uh, in the pair, uh, mm. which probably shouldn't. It's just the equivalent to like giving a blind guy a driver's license, um, <laughs> probably slightly dangerous. But um, so I did a little bit of that. Um, other sports. I did swim. Swim was hard because there's no point of reference when you're in water. And so you end up sometimes swimming off at some weird angle, no matter how hard you try to straighten yourself out. Yeah. Um, so I pushed some lane markers pretty good during my swim uh, <laughs> career. Um, bowling. I've done bowling. Bowling is like pitching. You have to be consistent and you have to find a delivery that works. Yeah. Um, and that's another one that I, I tried not to rely on the vision. I relied on points that I could um, orient myself and like go straight on um, and then make a pitch or make a, not a pitch, but make a, a, a throw that always followed through, you know, by the ear. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a couple of things I've done. I've also done, I did a 5k. Um, that was a time. Um, I need to train more if I'm going to do more of that. Yeah. Now dude, when it comes to, uh, tying your hair, kind of similar questions to sports, but what's your go-to tie ups and how's, uh, how are you been learning that process? So that's, that's an interesting one because it's one that I, you know, I'm still working on, so to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I always keep, I think like so many of us, I got, got hair ties on the wrist here. Um, nice. and Sick. yes, and it's, it's just about, you know, finding the same point to tie back. So, you know, finding that, um, it, it's, it, it's muscle memory. Um, yeah. you guys have talked about it in some of your videos as well. And it's about just knowing where you need to be. Um, braiding is, is my next challenge um nice. i can do um uh what are they called fish no yeah fish fish tail tail. Braids? yeah i can do those i can't do any other kind of braids i can't do 
you know, your standard three strand yet. I got to work on that. Okay. Um, but uh, I usually go men's tail, high ball, um, you know, kind of depends what I'm doing, but those are the main two. And then uh, I've done the fishtail braids a couple times. I need a little more length because I've got some layers going on. So the, the fishtails like to unfishtail themselves um, after a little while. So I'm looking yeah. forward to the next three, four months when I can uh, get some more length and, and get those going. But it really is. It's about feel. Um, you know, if I if I wanted to right now get this going. It's just a matter of like knowing where the hairs on your head are, where the point is that they all need to meet. Yeah. So that um, things can go. OK, and we'll do we'll do a bit of a. You know what I'm liking uh, watching you do this is uh, kind of your approach and how you, you how your hands are flipped like upside down versus just how I would do it. I think there's probably people who do it like you're doing it, but sure. uh, that's good to good to see. It's a good way to grab everything underneath without easily missing it. <laughs> sure. Well, you're right. And that's, that's, you know, one of the things that I initially really struggled with yeah. was that ability to, you know, put things together in a way that was cohesive enough not to lose hairs. Um, yeah. And that took some getting used to, but uh, nice. You know, Look at that. Balling dude. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> looks great Dude, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> killer so you know we talk about it often uh it's just like what the there's a lot of hair problems a lot of like annoyances and stuff what have been uh some of the ones for you that really drive you nuts um more recently uh the hair just getting in the food uh, oh yeah or interfering when i'm trying to eat um that's that's a thing um I wear a backpack for work because I, I, I uh, do childcare. So I have a first aid kit that's attached to my backpack. So okay. <clears throat> very often when we go outside, I go to grab the backpack and I sling it over one shoulder and, fl you know, flinch because it's yanking my hair. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, the first couple of times it happened, I was like, yes, like I, I hit that milestone where it's getting in the way of the backpack. Uh, that novelty wears off real quick. <laughs> um, that's cool. So yeah, those those are the big two. And um, other than that, I mean, wind, man, wind. The wind will get you. Yep, it'll it'll get us all. I think we can all unite, no matter what uh, anybody else believes in a windy day, man. It's a real we'll pain you. in the ass. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, you mentioned there are a, a few other visually impaired or blind guys in the Facebook group and in the community. How just how many guys or yeah? Or how did you know? We weren't or really you aware of previously, but yeah. I mean, it's it, we're thrilled to know that uh, these guys are 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 hanging. Well, I can't say we've seen each other out at a bar or anything like that. <laughs> right. um, but um, I so there was one guy that posted uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, mentioned it in his post, and then there was someone that commented on his post, kind of saying, "Hey, I'm also legally blind." Um, and so there's those two guys that I've seen for sure. Um, and you know, there may be others. I think there are, you know, for a long time when I jumped on the Facebook group, I kind of passively observed for a while because I was not exactly shy, but I wasn't sure how to phrase my questions about, you know, how to navigate this stuff from a blind perspective. Um, and I think that can be something that's kind of challenging. Um, and I think that, um, knowing that there's other guys out there, it's like, oh man, if, if you're waiting, you know, for some kind of information, reach out, man, you know, ask myself, um, ask, uh, you know, put out questions in the group. I will say that um, there's a couple of guys. So I try to describe my photos um, outside of alt text. Um, so alt text is just the way to describe photos where it's embedded in the picture. So if you have vision, you won't see it. Um, but I try to describe mine in the post because I'm trying to kind of bring it forward that some people may need those image descriptions. Um, but if you have questions, I mean, there's people in this group that have learned to do image descriptions, you know, when they make posts about, you know, a new hairstyle they're trying or a new product they've got a question about. Um, and so just seeing the support that I've gotten and that so many others have, uh, have dished out in the community over the last couple of years that I've been a part has been amazing. Um, and so I really appreciate that. And, um, I just want to say that, like, if, if you're looking for information, if, if you are, you know, blind or, or visually impaired in the community, like we're here for you, man. Heck yeah, dude. Now, just so maybe everybody can get better at this, you know, we live in this digital world. Everything is screens and phones and just like, seems like we live in a world where vision is even 
more like uh i guess not relied le- upon not yeah or uh, and i'm not even saying all this stuff is good for us you know but like everything's so visually heavy you know and how are you using these apps how are you reading websites watching youtube videos walk us through what that is and you know is and how, how do you do and it how digital creators like us can yeah, make can be it better. better yeah which sure. you, we talked about a little bit but you get the idea yeah so for a lot of uh of people with visual impairments there are different ways that people access things so some people can use like a screen magnifier and then they look at the same things everybody else does and they do it all visually they just need to make it bigger okay. um for me i use uh something called a screen reader a lot of the time and essentially what this does is it puts any text on the screen into speech form um and so, for example, um, in a post, you know, if you have text in that post, it'll read the text. But if you share an image, unless you describe the image, you know, sometimes it will try to generate a description on Facebook or something like that. But generally speaking, that that image is just kind of read aloud as, hey, they shared, you know, 13 photos in this post. It's like, OK, well, that's great. But what are those 13 <laughs> photos, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And even if you don't want to describe them all, just say, hey. You know, different pictures of our, our photo shoot. We were out at, uh, you know, the, like the one you guys just took. We were out at the beach. Um, there was something about dinosaurs in there. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, I didn't get a lot of the, I was going off of what people were saying in the video more than what things were looking like. But trying to describe the main, you know, the who, what, when, where, why, how of your mm-hmm. picture. And you don't have to write a novel, but give me a sense of what's going on. You know, if there's a new pack of hair ties that are being teased in in the picture, you know, say, hey. You know, these ones are, um, they look like this. Here's the, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a a pack that, you know, I have the blues. I like the blues. I'm a blue guy. Um, So just saying, hey, these hair ties, you know, come in in different shades of blue, ranging from like a light, you know, sky blue all the way to a dark navy blue. Um, I have one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I think uh, trying to get a sense for, it's hard to know what to describe too, because I don't always know when, when someone asks me, how do I describe something? It's like, man, that's a hard question because really the question that you're asking at that point is what's important, you know, what, yeah. what needs to be relayed. And one right. of the things that I think I was talking to probably both of you guys about is like, you guys have a brand in the long hairs. You guys, this is what you do. You have um, everything that you do fits into uh, your, the way that you reach out to your community. And when you describe your images, don't be afraid to include that, you know, Um, and that's that's advice I'd have for anybody. If you have a brand, if you have something you want to say, say it in your descriptions. Don't just say, you know, a black hair tie. You know, it's a sick black hairband for any occasion. Yeah. For highballing it and men's tailing it. (laughs) Yeah, man, totally. Uh, Yeah, that's phenomenal. And really all the platforms give you the ability to add alt text too, like even Instagram does to your images. Right. And Instagram so, used to be completely like inaccessible. I, I still <laughs> don't have an Instagram, but um I, I know now it's getting better. Yeah, okay. Okay. That um, whole thing is just extremely insightful and uh, you know, something that could be easy to just gloss over or not really think about much. Yeah. But honestly even from a writer's perspective is really a fun challenge to consider Mm. and when Mm. you think about how can you describe something in words with with no with no visual aspect to it yeah yeah how can you describe what something looks like and it actually is uh, i look at it as a really fun and interesting challenge can i and we had an exercise in our in our team building uh, retreat back in january mm-hmm. where we're all verbally describing a various shapes or patterns mm-hmm. on a page and the other people are supposed to draw it yeah and you can really see at the end how much of that was translated and how how, how it was interpreted and how someone heard just a lesson in communication but uh, it's extremely insightful. It's something that a lot of digital creators, including ourselves, could easily overlook. And yet it's worth it uh, yeah. to, you know, take a little bit of extra time and really just try to create that experience, that same consistent experience across mm-hmm. all of our, whether it's written or video or audio or whatever. Absolutely. Or, or visual. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Love- the- oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, you're good. I was just going to say the thing that, that I, I tell people about accessibility is, yes, it has this front facing view of being, you know, you're making the thing for the blind or, or the thing for the deaf. But here's the thing. 
most of that stuff is going to help everybody in some way, because maybe you're just a person who does better at picturing things when you read them. You know, maybe, um, you know, in, in a, a video or something like that, there's something you missed that if you have a description of something, maybe that adds to your experience too. And so I think it really fills out space that people don't necessarily always think about needing filling out because, you know, you assume those gaps are, are accounted for. But any accessibility measure that you would incorporate anywhere into anything you do really can help everybody. So it's a win, win, win. It's phenomenal, dude. Great feedback. And uh, for sure, we know we can, you know, make a lot of improvements in this uh, region for sure. I mean, when I look at our blog, you know, we've, we've almost like looked at our, I, I've, I've always known that alt text is more for accessibility than it is for like uh, SEO or anything like that. But as like, we've gone, you know, further in content creation and stuff, like we kind of have had a strategy of like adding the alt tags and stuff more for like SEO and to show up during image searches and stuff like that, which exactly. it works because when you type these certain things in, it's like we take over the whole Google image search, which is what our intention is, but having more of a, uh, of approach to accessibility, uh, would just spice all those things up. And like what El Rubio is saying here is, you know, adding the voice and some character in there and not that it has to be so long. Um, one point that I think the exercise we did at the staff retreat just totally spoke on was, uh, when you said that, you know, now you're really asking yourself, what do I need to communicate here? That's the most important. And cause when you don't think about what the exercise, uh, we did at our staff retreat was people would go off on tangents and start ripping off all these confusing things. And then like, everyone's confused. And then they're like, wait, hold on, stop. Let me start over. And then, you know, so it is a lot harder than you think initially. <laughs> Right, exactly. And that's one of the things that like, it's a skill. And I think um, this applies to so much stuff. But like, these are all things that you don't need to know about them until you need to know about them, right? Like, yeah. accessibility for me, is something I wake up and I, I work with in some facet or other every single hour of my life, because mm -hmm. I have to by circumstance. But for you guys, and, and for a lot of people who are, are watching uh, or, or listening to this podcast, you know, this is maybe something you've never thought about before. And, and people are always like, wow, that's amazing. And it's like, okay, it's all relative, right? And I hope, you know, my goal in anything like this is just to make you think about it, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm not here to be aggressive and be angry because there's plenty of that going around the world <laughs> as it is. I'm here to learn how to pitch, learn how to tie my hair, learn how to put all that together and become a functional human being. And if I help some people along the way doing that, or bring some more people into this community or, or strengthen the way that people are thinking about this kind of stuff. I'll take that as an added bonus. Dude. Phenomenal, man. Well, you're crushing it, man. And you're very well-spoken and very clear in your communication. It's great to chat. Um, I have a question about when you talk about accessibility and if you've seen this on some other websites, like, cause I've been starting to see it more and more, there's kind of like this accessibility button and you like press it and then it kind of gives you these options. Do you know what I'm talking about? And do you have any thoughts on that? And do you think that could be something helpful for us or should we do it a different way? Absolutely. I mean, the thing that I suggest a lot of the time is yes, have that accessibility option, but give just have a lot of times now, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not a tech guy, but the more options you can give somebody about, let's just take contrast, for example, you know, personally, my favorite way to read if I have to read visually is white text on a black background. And so mm. with your blog posts, my uh, phone will pop up automatically with a mode that I can do that. I can switch my colors um, to read the, the blog posts with that preferred color. But like someone else might prefer black text on a yellow background, which I know sounds like that would hurt your eyes. But for <laughs> some people, it lets them keep track of things better. And so having the more options you can give somebody, the better off they're going to be. Yeah. Um, and I think that really actually folds into the hair stuff for me, because the more options I have in terms of understanding the way that like a certain style is conveyed or what something is used for, the more ideas someone can give me about here's how to do this style. Here's what it looks like. And here's how people think about it. 
then I have that in my toolbox, right? I can use that for something. And I think the same thing applies to accessibility as a whole and it applies to hair. So win-win. Phenomenal. Chris, man, I was just going to say exactly what uh, Lynn said, El, El Moreno said a moment ago, just uh, you're extremely articulate in your command of language. It's clear that you've really honed that skill in over the time, uh, not having the vision aspect of it. And I've noticed you said several times throughout our conversation, this is how I explain things to people. And you have a thoughtful approach towards how to help people understand what you are communicating in the best way that you have in your toolbox as, that's available to you. And whether you're visually impaired or hearing impaired or, or have all of your senses, being that's an excellent skill to develop of being able to communicate what it is, the, the true intent of your communications. And uh, you re you're really exceptional at delivering it, man. And it gives us a lot. Uh, to be more aware of and just be more mindful mm -hmm. and some tools that we have in our toolbox to uh, improve our accessibility and putting our content out there in a way that lots more people can enjoy it in different ways. And just having the insight and perspective is a uh, really excellent yeah. opportunity to have you on the show, man. Well, I appreciate the the kind words. I appreciate you guys having me on. I mean, me, me taking time to put language together is probably a lot uh, better use of my time than me taking up. Uh, I don't know sports car driving um <laughs> i'll take it yeah uh I, I one more quote just having gone to a school for the blind it, it strikes me as having really been a a big addition to your i mean that, that, was, that sounds like it was a very valuable experience to you absolutely yeah I think a lot of what that gives so i also went to a lot of summer camps growing up that were specifically for the blind and whether it was for the for the camps or for the school, when, when you're in an environment where you can be around people like you in, in some form or fashion um, for a week, a summer, you know, growing up, I, I wasn't the blind kid anymore. I was just one of 150 kids at this summer camp. And we all told stories about how we would, you know, run into poles or, you know, mess with our vision teachers or, or, or whatever. And it was like we were just normal and able to compare those experiences. And I think finding that sense of community is so important to becoming confident in, in who you are. And the fact that I found that growing up in, in my summer camps and then in the School for the Blind, I found that within the blindness community. And I found that here with the hair community. I think it's so incredibly important to find a community of people who, even if they don't think exactly in the same way that you do, if there's some rallying point that you can all get around, and especially if you have the chance to meet those people in person and talk to them, that's one of the most powerful experiences that you can have. And, and for me, that's where the great cut comes in, is like, that's my chance to meet so many of, of you guys who have made that impact on me and on so many other people, and uh, really spend some time in, in chat in person and, and kind of have that community centric experience that is about the hair donation. It's about the community. It's about being out in California and it's about all of that at the same time. And that is what those experiences are about. And that's, that's what I look for, whether it's in the blind community or beyond it. Well, man, you are in a group of guys who are very similar to you from the standpoint of our, the length of our hair and uh, we're pumped to have you in the community, man. And stoked we got to have you on the show today. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any, uh, you mentioned that you do not have an Instagram, but if guys want to connect with you, uh, I think you're, I know you're very active on the Facebook group. Are there any other links or uh, handles or anything else where someone could connect with you if they're listening in? Yeah, so my, my Facebook and the Facebook group is uh, just Chris Matthews. And then um, I do have a YouTube channel called Blind Over Matter. Um, and there is where I've started posting some things about uh, the baseball. I've done some music covers and things like that. Um, so if, if that's something people want to check out, um, feel free. So nice. um, I'm looking forward to meeting more people. I, that's that's one of my favorite parts of, of being in the Facebook group and, and things like that is, is getting the chance to talk to people. So um, feel free to say hello. I, I don't bite. <laughs> blind over matter it's yeah. great on youtube chris thank you for the inspiration and uh you know the the ideas for us to get better and we are going to do it
Hey, I appreciate you guys and uh, keep doing the things that you do. I think um, maybe more than you think you guys are, you guys are helping out a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. Even if you're, uh, you know, your, your main focus is hair. I think you guys extend beyond it very well. And that let it lie that let's try that again. That re- it's Monday. We're going to, we're going to finish strong here. That let it ride <laughs> moniker that, that you guys have with you is, is such a multifaceted piece, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's about being who you are. And I appreciate that. Uh, I can do that. You guys can do that. And we can all do it at the same time. So thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, you guys heard it here. He's going to be at the great <laughs> cut 2024. Oh, throwing yeah. it down <laughs> with the boys. He is El Ciego. Yeah. He's letting it ride. Thanks for joining us, man. Had a great time hanging out. And until next time, long hairs, keep letting it ride. See you.